Hey guys, Tyler here. In previous Star Trek videos, I've examined the biology, history, and culture of the Changelings, aka the founders of the Dominion and the Gamma Quadrant, as well as their most powerful servant race, the Vorta. In this video, I'd like to do the same for the Dominion's first line of defense, the Jem'Hadar. A genetically engineered humanoid species, the Jem'Hadar make up one of the most powerful military forces in the galaxy during the late 24th century. Their unique physiology, upbringing, and social structure set them apart from many other alien species in Star Trek's Milky Way. Today I'd like to explore the science behind the Jem'Hadar using both real-world and in-universe concepts. Let's get started. While each Vorta that we meet on screen is a fully adult clone, the Jem'Hadar, as we learn, are generated in birthing chambers or hatcheries. Their growth cycle is accelerated so much that they reach full maturity only three days after emergence. They do not procreate naturally, and their species consists solely of males. Given that the Jem'Hadar are engineered, it's possible that the founders decided that artificial wombs like the tanks observers are grown in and fringe would be more efficient. Believe it or not, this type of reproduction actually has some basis in real-world science. To find out how, we have to go back to the year 1924, when British scientist J.B.S. Haldane coined the term ectogenesis, the growth of mammalian embryos in artificial environments. Haldane's essay Daedalus, or Science in the Future, was regarded at the time as a shocking piece of science fiction, but later proved remarkable in predicting many scientific advancements. In vitro fertilization, or IVF, was invented in 1959 and enabled the birth of a live rabbit. The first human pregnancy using IVF then occurred in 1973, although it only lasted a few days. But a major milestone was reached five years later, when Louise Brown became the world's first, quote, test tube baby after having been conceived on a petri dish. The next few decades saw rapid development in the field and at lower cost. By the early 21st century, it became a mainstream medical technology, with half a million test tube babies born around the world by 2004 and 10 times as many by 2012. Further developments in reproductive medicine included the first baby born to a mother with a womb transplant, which occurred in 2014, and three parent babies became possible in 2016. But an even more ambitious and challenging goal still lay ahead. Today, the possibility of replacing traditional pregnancies with artificial wombs continues to tantalize scientists. There are, of course, plenty of legal and ethical hurdles that still have to be overcome, but genuine progress has been made with artificial animal wombs. One study showed that a mouse embryo could be successfully grown on a lab-created extrauterine scaffold, and other studies proved that both goat and human embryos could survive for 10 days in a prototype artificial womb consisting of a machine that delivers amniotic fluid. In another decade or so, some believe that human fetuses could be brought to term using this method, with every step of the nine-month process monitored in perfect detail, ensuring a safe and efficient alternative to natural childbirth. If it became mainstream, mothers who choose this method would be freed from the lengthy, painful, and potentially dangerous cycle of a normal pregnancy. Advocates state it would also be another option for same-sex couples and single men to have children without the need for surrogate mothers, and it could potentially reduce the number of, well, political buzzword that starts with the letter A. So, it seems that the concept of growing super soldiers in tanks may not be as far-fetched as it first appears. But what about after they're born? As infants, Jem'Hadar have complexions that highly resemble humans, a significant departure from their final form. Within a day of maturation, Jem'Hadar children already have advanced cognitive reasoning and language skills. As they age, their skin thickens for better protection, pales to a bluish-gray color, and becomes scaly and reptilian in appearance. Though I should point out that the rhinoceros was another visual inspiration behind this design. As we could see in the latter seasons of DS9, with Jem'Hadar stranded in the Alpha Quadrant, their facial scales apparently never 
never stopped hardening, and they did so to the point where they became ossified, creating bony structures on their skulls. As of now, it's not clear if this double-edged process, this condition, would continue indefinitely and happen with scales on other parts of Jim'Hadar bodies. If yes, then an extraordinarily long-lived Jim'Hadar could meet the same fate as many real-world patients who have suffered from fibrodysplasia ossificans progressiva, or Stoneman's disease, becoming encased in an unyielding armored shell of what used to be their own skin, trapped motionless in their own bodies until their very last breath, that's not that far away. Since so skillful, capable, and highly resilient warriors the Jim'Hadar often are, this could possibly be another reason that we never see a 30-year-old specimen due to them eventually growing solid. Perhaps in their deafening, blinding hatred for these so-called solids, the founders managed to find, among other virtues and vices, a sickeningly ironic sense of humor. In further regard to their appearance, one real-world reason for the apparent metamorphosis Jimadar undergo is that the DS9 makeup team had to adhere to severe restrictions when it comes to makeup that could be applied to an infant. In fact, they were not allowed to apply any makeup, paint, or glue to the infant at all, so makeup supervisor Michael Westmore opted for a simple prosthetic. And I'd also bet that Rick Berman didn't want to reach deep into his pocket for the production of an animatronic puppet. Fewer makeup restrictions existed, however, for the boy that the infant grew into. As we see in The Abandoned, while adolescent Jim'Hadar do need food for nourishment, the only source of nourishment for adult Jim'Hadar is the drug Ketracel White. Ketracel White provides Jim'Hadar with all necessary nutrients, as well as an isogenic enzyme deliberately emitted from their metabolism. As a result, all Jim'Hadar are addicted to the white, a not-so-subtle metaphor for crack cocaine, which is regularly distributed by their Vorta overseers, a not-so-subtle metaphor for the CIA. Hi there, I'm Sponsor Clone. Tyler created me to help share the workload on some of these videos, and since he's kind of indisposed at the moment, I thought I'd take this opportunity to talk to you about today's sponsor, Skillshare. Skillshare is an online learning community with thousands of classes and members all around the world. Whether you're looking to start a new business or enhance your existing skills, Skillshare is the perfect place to start. With classes like photography, illustration, graphic design, and more, Skillshare lets you find classes that match your goals and interests. For example, I just completed YouTube, the structure behind creating viral videos with Dylan Reeves Fellows, and it had quite a few useful tips. Even as the channel grows, I feel there are always new opportunities to learn. Skillshare Add free so you can stay in the zone while you're exploring new skills. New premium classes are launched each week, so there's always something new to discover. And Skillshare's entire catalog is now available with subtitles in Spanish, French, Portuguese, and German. The first 1,000 people watching this video to use the link in the description box or my code Orange River will get a one month free trial of Skillshare. Join today to invest in yourself and your personal growth. Big thanks to Skillshare for sponsoring this video. Now let's get back to the Jim Hadar. Where were we? Oh yeah, we were talking about how the founders made the Jim'Hadar dependent on Ketracel White. All of this is the founders' means of ensuring Jim'Hadar loyalty to both the Vorta and the founders themselves. Without a steady supply of white, Jim'Hadar suffer, understandably, from withdrawal symptoms. Their circulatory system begins to shut down, and psychologically, they become uncontrollably violent, first attacking their enemies, then their Vorta overseers, then finally each other. The DS9 writers speculated that the Jim'Hadar's aggression may be a holdover from how their species behaved before they were altered by the founders, that they had a warrior society even more barbaric than the Klingons. This assumes that the Jim'Hadar were not totally artificially created from scratch, which has never been confirmed one way or the other in canon. Interestingly, some rare Jim'Hadar are born with the ability to produce the isogenic enzyme without taking the white, though these cases are few and far between, and they still regularly consume the drug and never know they aren't addicted. When it comes to some of their other physical attributes, all adult Jim'Hadar are designed to have excellent strength and vigor.
vision, both greater than humans. They also have limited natural camouflage, an ability known as shrouding, although they lose this ability when they suffer withdrawal from the white. All adult Jem'Hadar also require no sleep and have extremely resilient bodies, with a phaser set to stun having no effect on them. Jim'Hadar are engineered to be soldiers and to crew starships, nothing more. Their culture shuns all forms of relaxation and recreation, believing such things make them weak. In fact, Jim'Hadar fighters and probably other Jim'Hadar ship classes are not even equipped with chairs. They probably don't have toilets either for that matter. Most Jim'Hadar die young in battle, and those who live past the age of 20 are referred to as honored elders. As I mentioned earlier, no Jim'Hadar has ever been known to reach the age of 30. Like the Vorta, the Jim'Hadar are engineered to revere the founders as gods, though most Jim'Hadar have never even seen a founder. The engineering behind their unquestioning loyalty is also not flawless, which is why it is necessary to make them dependent on the white. The rebellion of a single Jim'Hadar company has also been known to make Dominion experts nervous about uprisings from other units, which could potentially lead to a complete takeover of the Dominion in less than a year. Though the glory of the founders means everything to the Jim'Hadar, they can also show a strong sense of honor among themselves. This is exemplified in the episode By Inferno light, in which a Jim'Hadar accepts execution for insubordination after he refuses to kill Worf, despite being ordered to by his Vorta superior. This indicates that at least some Jim'Hadar may prefer death to doing something that they consider dishonorable. Jim'Hadar combat units also follow a specific hierarchy. Every unit contains a Jim'Hadar first, who is in command under the supervision of a Vorta Overseer. Each Jim'Hadar after the first is also given an ordinal number rank, and if a first is killed, each member of the unit assumes the duties of the Jim'Hadar above him. He only receives the higher number rank, however, if his Vorta Overseer grants it. The Jim'Hadar even have ritual practices that they observe before each battle. I am first, Ometaklan, and I am dead. As of this moment, we are all dead. We go into battle to reclaim our lives. This we do gladly, for we are Jim'Hadar. Remember, victory is life. And victory is, is life. life. When Ketracel White is dispensed, another ritual usually takes place between the Vorta and ranking Jim'Hadar. First, O Mediclan, can you vouch for the loyalty of your men? We pledge our loyalty to the Founders, from now until death. Then receive this reward from the Founders, may it keep you strong. Jim'Hadar Firsts are also capable of distributing white among those under their command. And by 2374, Alpha Quadrant Jim'Hadar, who have a culture distinct from their Gamma Quadrant brethren, no longer recite the ritual dispersal statement as they believe they demonstrate their loyalty through their actions alone and not their words. When it comes to weaponry, the Jim'Hadar generally carry plasma weapons with pistol and rifle variants, both capable of firing disruptor bursts with three settings, stun, kill, and, well, vaporize. The disruptor bursts are laced with anticoagulants designed to slowly kill their enemies if the burst itself does not. Other weapons include subspace mines that vanish and appear at random, termed Houdini mines by Starfleet. They remember who Houdini is? And in close quarters, they use melee weapons called shock blades, as well as combat knives and bayonets. Indeed, Jim'Hadar weapons were designed to be totally unlike anything featured in the franchise before, and yet not be totally unfamiliar either. Between all these details, there's a reason that the Jim'Hadar had been one of the most feared armies in the galaxy for over 2,000 years. Covering the three Dominion species has been a lot of fun. I've learned a lot about what makes each race unique. I haven't really talked much about the history of the Dominion's territorial growth or its other member races, although in fairness there's only so much to go on in canon, and 
even in the novels and games. Hopefully you've enjoyed this little mini-series, and hopefully you'll continue to enjoy my other videos discussing various alien species in Star Trek. In the meantime, thank you all so much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to leave a thumbs up down below and don't forget to share it. That stuff really helps me out. If you haven't subscribed yet, be sure to do that as well so you won't miss future uploads, and click the bell icon to receive all notifications. If you want to support my work even further, becoming a patron or a member is a great way to do so. Links to those, as well as my social media and merch store, are in the description. That's all I have for this week. Live long and prosper. And don't forget, victory is life.